thanks for joining us. Uh, we've got uh, we've got an exciting uh, session ahead of us. We've got uh, we've got Greg and Mark from Partneromics. Um, they're going to take us through kind of uh, what what it is to kind of build a, and, and fine tune an operations uh, your operations in a uh, in a team environment and in the team for 2020. One and uh, he's got a few exciting kind of um, playbooks that he's going through, and I think uh, we're going to go through at least at least a couple of things uh, that you can hopefully use uh, starting you know next month and going into 2021. But I will let uh, Mark do a little bit of an intro of what he's doing over at Partneromics, um, kind of a high level what we're going to be discussing today, and then uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible. So. Um, he's going to be taking lots of breaks between slides um, to, to kind of allow you to get in there. But please don't be shy to just like interrupt and ask questions. It can be a little bit awkward with Zoom to do that, but um, just just get in there. So we'll, we'll try to make it as interactive as possible. Um, all right, Mark, I'm going to let you take it away. Um, and I'll, there's a, quite a few people still jumping in, but uh, go for it. Awesome. Thanks, Evan. Uh, yeah, just as Evan said, please. Uh, throw up your hand. Uh, let us know. Don't don't feel embarrassed or shy to interrupt us. Literally, we we are here for you. Uh, just very quickly, I want to spend the bulk of our time digging into questions, thoughts, insights from you guys as well. So we're going to jump into the content uh, here in just a second. But um, just to give you some context, so um, yeah, I'm from Partneronomics. Uh, basically, for the last six years, we have um, built and created multiple. Uh, frameworks of how to do this partnering thing. I started my career over 20 years ago at Sprint at their world headquarters here in Kansas City and ran partnerships with them for 13 years, moved on to another company, and then decided to dedicate my life to this world of partnering and partnership best practices. Um, I've also got my sidekick, Greg, on here with me. So Greg and I cross paths, as all of us partnering people do, right? We're relationship people. But Greg and I crossed paths many years ago um, as I was continuing to do the, the research and the work and reaching out to professionals all across the world to kind of figure out how to decode this partnering thing. And so Greg's very familiar with our methodology and he's implemented it in, in multiple companies across the country. And so I asked Greg to come on here just to give us a different lens into partnering and, and into our frameworks uh, and things like that. So uh, by all means, stop us, uh, throw out your questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, all that sort of stuff. Let's use this as an opportunity to learn from each other. Um, this, this isn't about you guys learning from me or us, it's about us learning from each other, because I always learn just as much from the people you know that I'm around uh, as much as they do you know, with me. So please uh, feel free to stop us. Hey, let me go ahead and kind of tee this up. So with the, the partnernomics methodology, there's really what we call the two core processes. All right, so one is really an operating system, and that is it's how the partnering function within an organization, how that partnering function should be organized and managed. And then the second lens into it, it's, it's how partnerships should be proactively managed and led um, when, you know, after they're signed, right? After you kind of sign the dotted line. So let me see, can everyone see the schematic of partnernomics? Okay, beautiful, I got this multi-screen going, sometimes it gets a little, gets a little crazy. So what we're gonna be talking about today is what we call you know, this number two area, this strategic partner leadership model. And so just as we said, you know, just as your laptop and today's you know, phones and even watches, right? they all have this operating system that has the tools, the, the procedures, the methods, the rules, all of those sorts of things. That's what the SPLM is, that strategic partner leadership model. It's the operating system of how the partnering function should operate within your company. And it's also how partnerships should be managed after they're, they're signed, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to step through each of these six elements, right? Vision, teams, goals, metrics, processes, and then results. And I am going to step into each of these six, but we're going to we're going to take them one at a time, and we'll stop through each one of these. And I want to make sure that we offer you know opportunities for you guys to ask questions or just provide your insights uh, on each of these components as well. Okay, so the first is vision. 
right? And so vision, our vision component is all about vision, mission, and core values. And so as you think about your company, to the extent that you're not the CEO, hopefully your CEO and, and other senior members of your organization have done a good job of painting the picture of where we're going, right? Kind of that, that long-term purpose, that 20-year vision of what our organization, what our purpose is and what we're intending to accomplish. Now, what we talk about is a mission. A mission is a multi-year purpose or a multi-year goal, but it's it's really something that allows, it gives us an ability to direct our daily work. We constantly just repeat our mission, our organization's mission, or even our team's mission, being in partnering. What is our mission? And then we immediately have, hopefully, a clear picture of what we need to work on, what we need to do. So at Partneronomics, our mission is to make strategic partnering become a core competency for every client. And so we don't have to think very hard or go very far to, to direct the work that we need to be doing. The third piece of this is what we call the core values. And that's really the beliefs that we have as an organization. There's countless studies that have been done that just show that people that, that have similar beliefs and have similar convictions, feel that, that similar purpose, um, they're able to to bond really tight relationships really quickly, build trust very quickly, and they're able to, to get these really transformative results from their organizations. Think about basically any not-for-profit, right? Not-for-profits are very purpose-driven, and hopefully all of our even for-profit corporations and organizations are, are purpose-driven. But the important piece and really step one is getting that, what we call the vision component, getting that clear. And so hopefully the CEO or the leaders of the team have created that for the company. But as a team leader, right, as that, as that partnering team leader, I'm going to recommend to you, and it definitely is a best practice, that you also have team-specific kind of vision, mission, core values, those, those purpose components, so that you can really accelerate your ability to build relationships and just the team itself. Okay. Let me stop there. I'm going to, now I'm going to stop at each one of these. This one's hopefully kind of like, okay, Mark, yeah, I get it. Um, the book built to last. I don't know if the book built to last uh, rings a bell or not, but uh, Jerry Porus um, and Jim Collins, Jim Collins wrote good to great. They have an awesome book, kind of a timeless book. It was published well over a decade ago, but they talk about the importance of this and how it really revolutionizes the ability for organizations to work together. Okay, so let me stop there for a minute and just you know ask Greg if he has uh, some something that he wants to kind of sprinkle into this or if there's any other questions, thoughts, comments, all that sort of thing from any of the other attendees. Well, Mark, I'll, uh, I'll color in a little bit. Um, and you kind of touched on it. Uh, you and I came together several years ago. Um, I've been doing this for 25 plus years uh, at different levels from Fortune 50 companies. I'm working with very, very large ecosystems to startups. And this vision part is really important. And, you know, when you think of this framework, it's funny because I've been doing this my entire career and kind of with a kind of my own kind of recipe, if you will. And, and when Mark and I came together and he had this framework, it was uh, uh, really changing for me because this is exactly what I had been looking for. I've kind of been practicing it in, in many ways, but this vision piece was really important because this is one of the things, uh, think of me as the execution component of this. So you have the framework, the the methodology, uh, you know, all the different components we're going to touch touch on. But what I can bring is, is kind of that real world where the rubber meets the road execution side of this framework. That's what I've been doing kind of in, in many cases, a almost a fractional partner development leader where I go in and this is what I do. Um, I help companies identify, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what their, you know, what their goals and vision. Uh, you have to establish that first in, in the executive leadership team. Uh, everyone has to be on board. And we'll get into some of these other other components. It's kind of hard to talk about one area because they all kind of blend in together. Uh, but you talk about the core values. You know, I'm looking at, uh, you know, I call it DNA in my world. Uh, do we have the right DNA? Do we have the, you know, 
all of the pieces together, the mission, what are our goals, objectives, what's the why behind it. I, I go through a very consultative um, kind of process when I start working with a company and, and getting them prepped to you know move into an indirect uh, either their sales or uh, partnering strategy. Um, but this is really important. All these pieces are very important and, and you'll find that they all kind of blend in, in together. Um, let me stop there for a second yep. and uh, get some oxygen back to the room. And, <laughs> and we'll also talk a lot about alignment and the importance of alignment. And alignment always starts internal, right? Inside of your organization first. And then it looks to get alignments with potential partners or what I what we call over the fence with those folks. And so, you know, first things first, what we need to do is make sure that internally from the partnering team all the way up to the CEO or depending on how large your organization is, um, it's, it is absolutely critical to start with alignment of understanding really what the vision behind the partnering initiatives are and the partnering function there is. Um, as I said, please stop, scream, yell, throw something if you want us to stop. Otherwise, you know, we're just going to kind of keep cruising through the, the content, but please don't be bashful. Um, the next thing that we're going to step into is the teams, right? The teams element. So this is all about people. And as we always say, you know, uh, companies don't do business with companies. People do business with people. And so it's all about relationship. It's all about people. There is one thing that is going to predict success, and that's the ability to work with others. It, it all comes down to people. And so there's three components here that we really need to be mindful of as we build these teams and as we engage in partnerships. Number one is just, it's, it's the know-how, right? It's the knowledge. I mean, how do we do this, this partnering thing? And if your career was anything like mine, uh, you didn't have a playbook. You didn't. You didn't go to boot camp. You don't have a degree in in strategic partnering. Nobody does. Uh, but we have to learn this thing um, as professionals. And so, you know, what is the know-how to to do this partnering thing? And then, more specifically, what are what are the skills? So, it's one thing to know. The next thing is to be able to to do that through a performance. And then the third is just. The, the behaviors and the mindsets that it takes to do partnerships. You know, it's, it's a bit of a different mindset. A lot of people, actually, I was just uh, talking to Jay McBain last week. We were on the conversation about, uh, he's a, an analyst with, with Forrester Research and probably knows this space of partnering better than anyone else, just from a, from a research perspective. But uh, he was saying that, a lot of the really good partner development leaders are the people that are doing this partnering thing. They mostly resemble CEOs because just the breadth of the role of partnerships. I mean, one minute we're in the middle of marketing, then we're in finance, we're doing business cases, we're doing, we're working with product development, and then we're we're over negotiating deals, we're writing contracts, we're building and sometimes repairing relationships. You know, we're all over the board here. And so the team's component is obviously it's critical, but the, the idea behind teams is to put people into partnering teams and in partnering roles that are going to thrive there. And it's, it's not cut out for everyone, but, uh, you know, just being really mindful and understanding what it takes to, to, to set someone up for success. And then I also think, and probably all of us on this call can attest to it, is you really have to enjoy learning and you have to enjoy challenges because no two days are the same and the world never stops, right? We just continue to evolve and go and new technologies come out, new potential partners come out. And so we find ourselves always learning. And that's one of the things that I really love and really enjoy um, about this role. But uh, are there any thoughts, questions, uh, any, any insights that anybody on the call wants to share about the Teams piece? Hey, so quick question. Are, are we going to kind of dive into each one of these areas a little bit? Or should we ask these as we go along? Ask as, ask as we go along, please. 
<laughs> so, so then if we back up a little bit, just what, what would a, a typical vision look like um, that, that you've seen before just to kind of get us, cause, cause my idea is like the, the, the partner piece vision should be relatively consistent across partner programs and then tie into, you know, for the purpose of, and then tie into whatever the overall company uh, 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 vision is, right? Yeah, you're spot on. You're yeah. spot on, Jason. And so here's here's the thing that I've seen working with companies literally all over the world. Sometimes, unfortunately, and as much as I disagree with it, it's not my call, but I'm still surprised at how many companies even that I work with, sometimes huge companies, that they don't have an explicit vision for the organization. And so in cases like that, I'm like, okay, Jason, okay, Sally, you be the CEO of your partnering function. You be the CEO of your partnering team and you create a vision, you create a mission, you construct this stuff for your team just as though you are the CEO because you are the CEO of your team. You're not the CEO of the company, but you're the CEO of your team. And so if they don't have vision, mission, core values stated, uh, number one, I say build them. But if they do have them for their organization, at a, you can either pull them straight down and say, okay, this is ours for our team. Um, or what I, what I like to see is make it your own. Own it and make it your own. But but it has to be congruent. It has to be in line with it. It, it definitely cannot go against you know what, uh, what what you're doing from a company perspective. But you know, so many times, frequently, actually, more often than than what I thought I would see coming into this five six years ago, companies a lot of companies don't have a real explicit vision or mission, and so as they're looking at how they kind of what they're trying to drive towards longer term they don't have that north star to to travel towards and so we ask them to own it i mean well, I can chime in if you want jason and tell you what ours is yeah great so i work at league apps and we create uh technology and we build community to help local sports organizers run their uh, local sports org. So these are rec leagues, club teams, or, or mostly youth sports tournaments. Sure. Our, our company mission is to help create amazing sports experiences for all. And we had you know six blueprint initiatives. One of those initiatives is specifically to establish league apps as the go-to platform in the youth sports industry. And so that's specifically my job uh, to help establish league apps as that platform. So, you know, the analogy we use is like Salesforce is the platform for basically the whole sales. You know, um, there's a company called MindBody that's like, a, we use that as a good example. They're sort of the platform in the wellness industry. And so we want to become the go-to platform in the youth sports industry. And that's, that's my job by, uh, you know, identifying about 20 to 30 different youth sports technologies that we can, that will build on the league apps platform and make it really easy for my customers to, you know, run their entire industry using League Apps at their, the center of their technology stack. Great. So, so then to put in in context, so I run implementation partners, typically agencies and SIs, uh, technology partners uh, to help build gaps in our product roadmaps, and then uh, strategic alliances. Um, and so, like two years ago when I started, it was to build the build a world-class uh, ecosystem, and then for the purpose of, uh, you know, uh, creating a, you know, digital, uh, uh, you know, a leading digital experience uh, platform company. And today it'd be more like operate a uh, world-class digital, uh, world-class uh, partner ecosystem uh, for the purpose of, right, um, uh, creating a, a, a digital experience. Like th that, is that kind of like, a, a, does that capture the essence of what you're talking about? Yeah, Jason, I mean, so just to share kind of like with, with the methodology of the framework or kind of the best practices out there in the big, in the big world is a vision is typically that 20, 25 year picture, right? That long North star that we're all going to. And at Partnernomics, it's help the world leverage the power of partnership. 
Well, that's that's a big ass thing, right? And and the vision, just like that, is in shared and built to last, right? That's like the Bible of this topic. Um, it's it should be so aspirational that you you literally never accomplish it. But then as we come down to one layer, right? That that then that's mission. And that's mission is like a multi a multi year goal, right? So the mission of partnernomics okay. is to make strategic partnering become a core competency for every one of our clients. And so that's something that we can wrap our, our arms around. And so as we work with different companies, we want to make strategic partnering become a core competency for them. And, and then coming down a layer deeper, at, or another element of that is core beliefs, core values, right? So for us, it's honor, courage, commitment, economic value. And so if people don't believe what we believe at our core, they're probably not going to be real energized and be excited about our purpose of what we do. And so as, as we kind of set out to build our teams and to recruit people to, to get excited about what we do, that's where we believe it has to start, right? And it's, this isn't something that we came up with, right? There's hundreds and hundreds of other thought leaders, thousands of thought leaders that's come long before us that um, that have spelled this piece out. Mark, I'll, I'll add a couple things on this. Uh, and again, I'm always going to look at this from an execution perspective when I get engaged uh, with companies. And that vision part, really important to understand just from a macro company, long-term ver- uh, uh, vision of the company. Uh, but then that mission part's really important important because from an execution perspective, um, what I do or what I coach is that mission kind of goes into every year. This is something that's kind of a, it's a measuring stick. And so I'm always, I call it vital factors. We'll start off the year looking at vital factors and those kind of pivot around this short purpose for the year. And then oftentimes internally and externally, and again, from an execution, just growing a, a partner ecosystem and, and culture within a company, I look at those vital factors, which is really the mission, and start to uh, refer back to that. Are we, are we staying true to our mission? And, how, and the vital factors are really a measurement of that. And so as I'm going through that process, um, we start off the year looking at the, at the mission, the vital factors, and then we kind of measure that. And we'll do quarterly vital factor reviews, which really I point back to the mission. Are we on track? Are we staying true to the mission? And then at the end of the year, and and that's internally, but I also do that externally. And to the point that uh, Mark was making earlier, you kind of do operate in this kind of gray area of you know, managing and operating an entire uh, across multiple departments and cross pollination across those departments internally, but you're also doing that externally from the point of influence. And so having that alignment uh, on the vision, the mission, and then the measuring stick in those missions oftentimes is the vital factors and giving a, you know, a reference point to go back. Are you, are you tracking with that? And then of course the core values and the belief and, and, that comes into my world all the time when I'm looking at at partners that are going to fit, you know, align with our vision, align with our our mission, our tactical uh, vital factor components, and then those core beliefs. Do they have the DNA? Are they, you know, do they have the makeup in a similar way that we are? And and are we going to be able to work together? And, and there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, but if you get all of those things in alignment, I found that that's. You know, that kind of feeds into everything else we're going to talk about, but it's really kind of the recipe for success. You have to have that because it, it becomes a, a reference point uh, throughout your journey that you should uh, be checking in on, uh, on on a regular, you know, quarterly or semi-annually, certainly an annually basis. Uh, but that's part of the part of the execution part that I get involved with to ensure we have that out of the gate and then everything else kind of falls in line. Jason, one thing that uh, that you said that really resonated with me is that you know it, it changes, it shifts, and missions do. Missions will change for for companies and for organizations, for teaming organizations. So, yeah, you're you're definitely spot on. <laughs> if you're treading water, yeah. you're you're eventually sinking, right? So you're you're definitely spot on. It it should be it should be adjusting over time. Um, and then we hit uh, this uh, this teams component here, right? The know how, the knowledge. 
right? Then it's, it's, the, it's really the performance. It's the skills. It's putting that to work and then having the right behaviors. Um, are we good to any thoughts, questions, comments on, on this one? But uh, the, the model itself, the strategic partner leadership model, it's in, in one respect, it kind of can be a, a sequence of how we set this up, but it's not a linear path. Right, it's not linear. A lot of this is is running in parallel that, that we need to that we need to manage and that we need to optimize. I'm going to step into the third piece here. Um, so this is all about goals, right? And the thing that's so critical, there's a lot of things that's critical about goals, but whenever we sit back and we think, what the heck are we supposed to be working on? What is what is important to the company? What's important to our team? We should have to look no further than what are the goals. But I can I can also tell you that working with different partnering teams, one of the things that's not done well is setting goals. And what I mean by that specifically is we we recommend the smart approach, right, of goal setting, which is it's all about getting them very specific, very measurable. So many times goals are set out there to Let's increase customer satisfaction. Let's reduce churn. Let's increase our quantity of clients. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> we got to put a number to it. And uh, so one of one of the people that we do a lot of collaboration with is a gentleman by the name of Chris McChesney. He was the author of the book, Four Disciplines of Execution. And I love the pieces that he works through whenever it comes to goals, metrics, and even into processes. But he says... Starting line, finish line, deadline. And so just a general framework as you think about goals, goal setting, goal management, give yourself a starting line, give yourself a finish line, X, you know, X by, you know, Z, lay it out in, in those terms. And, and that will kind of force you to get goals that everyone can clearly understand of where we are, Here's where we need to be, and here's the deadline. Here's the date to get there. And then also another piece that's critically important here is goal alignment. So it's understanding internally what, what our goals are, where we need to be by when, but then also just seeing what are our partner's goals? What are they trying to accomplish, and when are they trying to accomplish it by? And then what we need to do is – Partnerships that have the best probability of success are those partnerships where our partner's goals are already perfectly in line with our goals. So as they're putting resources in place, you know, as they're kind of traveling down that path, they are just in natural alignment to be on our road as we're getting down there. That's the best opportunities to hit this natural alignment. And so as we seek new partners or as we you know, form deeper and deeper relationships with partners and understanding of, of how we are going to best be able to leverage each organization's assets is to really understand what their goals are, but really try to position ourselves on their path. Because that's where you know, we're, we're definitely going to have our, our best opportunities for growth. Another, the last success practice that I'll throw out here that I really encourage you guys to see is so many times, and I think it's just because, you know, for, for those of us that have been playing this game for 20 years or more, is we're used to seeing this annual goal cycle. I encourage you to shorten that up and set a 90-day cycle. Pull it back from the year and go to a 90-day cycle. It's almost like almost like forcing an agile approach into your business. But just do 90-day checks. And then that way it gives us you know, more ability to, to adjust fire. But then it we don't weld it into our brain where we think is going to be relevant in, in 365 days. Because odds are we're going to need to make some adjustments there. And uh, man, it's, it's made a world of difference for a lot of the different clients. But we see it as a success practice across the board. Just look at that 90-day window and then adjust from there. Love to just stop there and, and take some, some 
questions, thoughts, some some practices that you guys have in your companies? Mark Jeff, I see in. you nodding your head. I can't let you be quiet. Uh, I'll, Mark, I'll step in and and uh, just give an example, and I'll uh, for I'll protect the names, but I'm working with a a major league sports team uh, and MLB, and and I just share this as an as an example because everything we've talked about from vision teams and goals uh, the goals was a really important piece for us to understand you know what are their goals for this partnership uh, what are our goals uh, get that alignment and and you may talk about this at some point this may be an appropriate point to, to kind of insert the concept of the term sheet but this is where we started uh, putting together our term sheet around the vision the teams the goals what are the objectives? And interestingly enough, uh, and I, th I thought it was fascinating because, you know, with the partner I'm working with, the, the two I'm working with, one's very much in the in the, the deliverable of cost savings. And they, they achieve a significant cost savings uh, for their organizations. They partner with organizations and how they uh, how they leverage and use those, those cost savings and go to market. Well, with the MLB team, um, their goal was to go out and really drive corporate sponsorships, but they want to do it in a philanthropic cause or, or effort and defining what, what is that purpose? Well, that it was interesting because we started talking about the philanthropic component that's going to drive further corporate sponsorship revenue to the organization. It fit right in alignment with the other partner I'm working with and just kind of marrying these two together uh, but to get all of those things documented, kind of set the milestones, and then we 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 put all of that in a term sheet, that that becomes our reference point. And kind of when I, I talked about the vital factors a bit ago, um, you know, they adjust and change a little bit, but it became very interesting that we were very much, we found uh, through that process, very well aligned on our corporate philanthropic endeavors and, and goals. And that that became a key pivot point that everything fed into that. And so once we, once we did that and developed the milestones, how are we going to achieve this? How are we going to make this much impact into these local communities? Very, very, uh, very successful engagement um, and excited about where that's headed and, and the good we're going to do with it. But that's just an example of, of identifying the goals, setting those, those milestones within that so they're attainable. Otherwise, that goal just is kind of a reach, but you have to have something – that's attainable, a quarterly win that I can check that off and we got there. Um, really important to just keep the momentum of the partnership. And then we review that and kind of those vital factors. And do we need to make adjustments or pivots? Uh, and then reset that for the next 90 day sprint, if you will. Um, but that process is really important to the overall success of you know a new partnership or even an, an existing partnership that that hasn't been you know I, I call it you can either be you know reactive and opportunistic or proactive and strategic and so you kind of have to work with both of those uh, from an execution perspective to get your you know to get your proper balance between uh, between the organizations. I'll just uh, add into that that probably pretty standard for our own teams, especially as it relates to, you know, how we are providing a function for our company that we have goals, right? We have team goals, whatever they are. But how many of us explicitly lay out goals for our partners and our partnerships? And so many times we're like, yeah, we're going to do a deal with whomever, right? You, you pick the company. We're going to do a deal with them. In our mind, we know what the fit is. We know what we want out of them. We've even had that conversation with them and negotiating the deals and putting different terms in place. But have we explicitly put out in 90 days, we need to accomplish these three things? I can tell you most of the time we don't. But that can truly be revolutionary. Because this all goes back to alignment, you know, aligning with where we're putting our resources and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, a lot of times we want our partners, we expect our partners to be mind readers. Well, they're not, <laughs> you know, they're not. And so there's so much that can be done. And again, that's kind of why we hit this, you know, with, with goals. But uh, going back to what Greg said, there's a whole kind of another side of this methodology, which we call the five phases. 
which we'll actually talk about next Tuesday. But uh, you know, that's where we have the term sheet. And then we lay other components out that explicitly show this is what I'm looking for, right? We, we call partnerships the, the marriage of business, right? You have this courting phase, this, this, this dating phase. Well, here's what I'm looking for in this relationship. Here's the value that I think I can get. Here's what I'm looking for. And then also we have the obligation to, to, to flip the script. Given what you are trying to accomplish, you know, Mr. Or Mrs. Partner, this is what I believe we can provide to you. But what we need to do is put it in paper, put it in a script, put it in a timeline. And those are goals. Those are goals and those are milestones. And again, make it a 90 day cycle. Make it a 90 day where you revisit that. Um, whenever we get over to processes, we'll talk about you know how we have these conversations, these continual conversations. But goals going past 90 days, I would I would move away from those and just make it that 90 day cycle. Any right. other thoughts? Oh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll make a little comment. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, no, just something that resonated. So some context. Um, I joined I joined Brand Folder four weeks ago to head up partnerships. Um, they have a flagship, very large partner that needs me to uh, to attack. And some just some context. But I think what resonates here is partner goals. Um, an organization says, well, that partner's got a thousand salespeople. What do you mean they're only doing X? So it's a way of helping them understand their goals, but also communicating back to manage expectation, how they're really set up. Yes, they have 800 salespeople, but let me tell you how they're set up. But then more importantly, having your partner put together what are their goals? Now you know where you're starting from rather than I think you should do X. So I, that resonates with me and that's a, a process I'm going through. The other thing that resonates with me is the 90-day cycle, especially in my case of building a new program. It takes learning. It takes adjustments. Either who I'm reaching out to, what the pitch is that I'm reaching out to, where there's traction. And so that just really resonates to me about really um, – and that helps alignment because now you're partnering with leadership saying – the last 90 days, this is what the goal was to hit X number of companies in this realm with this type of pitch. Here's what I learned. Let's talk about adjustments. So I, I appreciate the, those two facets that you just shared. Good. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to jump into metrics to make sure that we don't run out of time. I want to make sure that we have an opportunity to, to hit all of these um, metrics, right? So, uh, you know, just using data to support decisions, nothing new for us. Um, we're huge believers in scoreboards and it's easier said than done getting good scoreboards, but we have to at least start with getting them and uh, defining those, building those. And some data is better than no data, but it starts with building a strategy around scoreboards. What information do we have? What information do we need? What information can we get on this regular basis? But at the end of the day, what we need to be able to do is flip the game on switch. If, if we can see the scoreboard on the wall, then we can get people engaged to, to play and put effort and they know if they're winning or not. Um, I was literally just on a, on a Zoom call a few minutes ago uh, with the director from Monday monday.com and he said man if there's one thing one thing that can describe their company is they're so transparent they have scoreboards everywhere for everything and people can see what's going on outside of salaries if you if you want to see it you can see it just look up you're going to see a screen and you're going to see the scoreboard and he said that drives so much engagement and the, the game on switch is is always live and well and so as we peel the onion a little bit on scoreboards, you know, KPIs, key performance indicators is nothing new for any of us. But the way that we use scoreboards is, is through this idea of KPIs, leading indicators and lagging indicators. And here's a little bit of kind of where we could put science into this. If, if something is a lagging indicator, that just means that it's a result, right? We need to have a million dollars in revenue you know, through the channel by the end of this month. We need to have 12 new partners by the end of this quarter. Well, that's a result. And, and we need to have those. We set those in place, right? Those are essentially our goals or our milestones. 
But really to get scientific on using metrics as a tool for success is looking at leading indicators. And so the leading indicators are those KPIs or those metrics that will predict, right? They will predict what our, what our result is going to be. And so whether that's just like in the sales world, right? It's leads turn into the outcome. It is sometimes it's marketing dollars turns into. It is uh, the, sometimes the quantity of partnerships. Not always, but sometimes it's the quantity of partnerships. What we need to do is figure out, and we recommend three. What are three leading indicators? What are three things that can predict what an outcome is going to be? And then as you're working with your team, you're managing, you're leading your team, and you want to stomp on the, on the gas, it's actually those leading indicators. It's those leading activities that if they're truly leading indicators, it's those activities that will increase what your outcome is going to be. And so, so many times we focus on, here's what the outcome needs to be by the end of this month, by the end of this quarter. But that's a result. That's an outcome. We need to focus on the things that are going to predict that. And so I'll just encourage you to think about what those leading indicators are for the pieces, you know, the, your success pieces, and then figure out ways to, to stomp the accelerator on those. Mark, I'll give, a, and I'll be brief here because I, I want to be mindful of time, but just a, uh, particularly on leading indicators. And one of my areas of expertise is I really focus in on channel, channel sales, indirect sales, and driving, you know, driving top line revenue through a a partner ecosystem, and and one of the things that I look at from a leading indi- uh, leading indicators is, uh, and I take it, I look at it from a macro, but all the way down to a micro, down to an individual level. Um, I create scoreboards uh, for those uh, those that are part of the you know one of the variables in the equation. It might be a direct sales rep that's that's kind of role based into a into a. Uh, uh, a relationship with their counterpart with a partner and I look at what I call APRs and action proceeds results I can I can give you some quantitative direct correlation between APR action proceeds results meaning activity and engagement with uh, that counterpart to their uh, to their their assignment on the on the partner side and this is really speaking in, in the context of channel sales But it gives a, you know, I can look at that as a leading indicator and I can immediately tell that if somebody is coming in under quota, I can look at that APR and I can tell you precisely why and where those gaps are. It's a leading indicator into either over attainment or under attainment. And and, and that's a key factor, particularly, you know, there's a lot of partner uh, components, but one area I focus on and and kind of an expert in is, is in that channel strategy. And there's a, there's a lot of leading indicators that you can look at, but it's really important that it's not subjective. It has to be, you know, you have to have scoreboards and measurement so you can go back and look at that and dissect it and let the data tell the story. And it's very easy to do. And it's very clear when you see it uh, from a metrics perspective. And, you know, it's creating dashboards and Salesforce or your CRM dynamics, whatever it happens to be. But I, I leverage that very heavily and not as a punitive way, but as a proactive way. Uh, if I see somebody that I need to lift up, I can almost always point to that and find those those areas that need a lift. And it might be training or other areas. But anyway, uh, I'll uh, I'll leave it at that and just share a little a little nugget there on, on my side. Awesome. All right, guys. So we've got about 10 minutes left, 13 minutes. I want to step into processes real quick and just share some of uh, some of the insights here. And uh, then we can kind of talk about what, uh, what we might want to do for next steps. So just real quick in processes, right? So, you know, there are so many things that we do in this partnering role, right? It's, it is vast. And uh, lots of different folks, I, mean, I was on uh, having a conversation with Jay McBain, right? So one of the thought leaders in our space, uh, one of the Forrester analysts. And he said, you know, the role that's inside of businesses that is probably most like, I'm paraphrasing, that's most like a CEO 
is somebody that's running these partnerships because we can touch pretty much anything in the company from marketing to finance to product development to legal to you name it. And so it's really critical that we build out processes to identify how we are to do this thing, right? And I definitely recommend the 80-20. You know, there's, we could, we could write out 20% of the processes that are going to touch 80% of, of our time spent, and that will be a significant value um, for a company. So number one, what do we do? Let's, let's document what we call the core processes. And so there's two of, there's really two of them. At a minimum, there's two of them for each company. And that is this piece here, right? That uh, strategic partner leadership model. Think about your organization, your partnering organization, that partnering function, your, your operating system, and put some processes around that. What does it look like to create goals? What does it look like to create a new uh, scoreboard? What is your hiring process? Going back to teams, what does your hiring process look like whenever you bring team members on? So documenting those processes. Number two, having the discipline to follow the processes. <laughs> so many times we don't follow processes or we, or we allow people to get by without following processes, right? So we got to get them to follow the process. And then number three, what we need to do is it's about process improvement, continually optimizing, continually optimizing um, each of those different processes. And whether it's individual contributors on our team or whomever is on our team, they're seeing things and they're also getting feedback from partners that our eyes and ears aren't getting. And so we need to have those open lanes of communications to understand what uh, other people on our team and other people in our organization, what they're hearing. But uh, it's all for naught if we're not improving, if we're not putting that in place and, and continually improving what our processes are. But uh, yeah, the two core processes, number one is this operating system, the strategic partner leadership model. And then the other core process that every partnering team has is how you go from partnering idea, or really that strategy, to engaging, finding, evaluating potential partners, what we call phase two. Phase three is negotiating, starting that bargaining of putting the terms, you know, floating terms back and forth of what makes sense for a, an impending partnership. And then the go, no go decision. We call it phase four, close, yes or no. And then in in times when we consummate the deal, we sign the deal, we say, yes, let's, uh, let's kick off this partnership. Now it's time to operationalize that partnership. And then that's whenever we can then use the strategic partner leadership model again. You know, so many times we get fixated on, is the deal signed? Did you get the deal done? Did you get the deal done? Well, sometimes it can be challenging to get the deal done, but we all know that's the easy part. Right? It's about getting results. And that's that's the tough part, and that's that's why we make the big bucks, so to speak. Um, but it's uh, yeah, but funny. processes. Go ahead. Yeah, it's funny, Mark. I, I I've consulted with a lot of organizations on the sales side, uh, but it must be a trend now. But uh, a lot of companies have a big gong, and they'll bang the gong for a sale, a win, a closed deal, and even when you have a partner strategy, they come in and they bang that gong for a you know, we just signed up and closed a deal for a great new partner. Um, that and I, I preached uh, executives uh, looking at gone for signing a new deal is exciting, but make sure that you go on the due diligence and all the process because if you don't have that in place, you don't transition to that next, then that the 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 bang of that gong starts to numb and eventually uh, there's no worse feeling than losing a partnership because lack of process uh, lack of operationalized Greg I think we're having some uh, some internet connectivity issues uh, but I think I know what you're saying so I will quickly summarize um you know, whenever, yeah, so we're banging the gong whenever we sign deals, but we all know it's not about getting signed deals. You know, it's about executing. And um, uh, it's a, that's a good segue there, Mark, to uh, the session we're having next next week. <laughs> the, 
shift the strategy to execution. I mean, you can have the best strategy and sign the best deal, but if you can't activate them and you can't have some process there to guide you through that relationship, especially in the beginning parts, it's like you just wasted a lot of time and effort. Yeah, no question. So next Tuesday, if uh, folks are able to join, I definitely look forward to having you guys cruise through that process as well. One of the things that's a little bit unique about the session that we'll go through next week is uh, tools, really having specific tools. So one of those tools, for example, uh, being the term sheet that we chatted about a little bit here and uh, the ways to use that to streamline the process that we go through from idea all the way down to an executed deal. Um, Greg and I are huge believers and have done a lot of trial and error to, to tune what that process looks like and even working with legal, what are some of the best practices, some of the success practices of when to include legal and different partnership types, when to include them and how to expedite that relationship and, and just kind of that, uh, that process. Um, let me um, let me just kind of stop there. So we got about five minutes left, um, man. It just as 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 you could see, I, we could literally spend an hour or two on each one of these elements if we really dug into them. Um, I would be willing to uh, to come back for a round two on this conversation if this onion has ten layers we might have hit layer one of the 10 layers. But here's a question, Mark, as a, just as a kind of be mindful of time, um, you know, 2021 planning out our kind of ops, you know, if you were to kind of summarize, and I know it's not really doing it justice, if you were to summarize of what you should focus on, obviously starting with a vision, integrating your team with it, like summarize the last few of these uh, octagons uh, into 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 kind of a, 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 an advice, uh, what would it be? Yeah, so start, implement, get, grab an operating system. Whether it's this or something else, whatever, just get something, but be very intentional and be very diligent about your partnering operation. Definitely set and get clear goals internally within your team, make sure they're aligned all the way up to the C-suite. And then also understand what your partner's goals are, make sure that they're aligned. And if, if they're not, if it's not the, one of their goals, whenever life gets busy, they're going to go do their goals. And if it's not providing value to your company, you're gonna have a rough future. And it, it has happened to all of us, right? So set those goals. Just do a 90-day view. Do the 90-day look um, on goals, goal setting, and just take more of an agile approach. And then each uh, 90 days, then you make those adjustments, getting them in place. Um, communicate, communicate, communicate. That's really what results. Uh, the, this last component here is... It's about you know having good, solid communication with your team members, about having good, solid communications with your partners, and understand that not all partnerships are created equal. You will have some very transactional partnerships, okay, awesome, and, and that's going to probably be the bulk of your partnerships if you're like most partnering leaders. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you should have, you probably have some truly strategic partnerships, right? Some of those partners that can truly create this paradigm shift can truly give you the ability to, to, to achieve exponential growth or to get on that path. Those are the ones you need to spend most of the time with because you're creating the script as each day passes with them. You don't have a recipe. You're building that recipe with them. So just make sure that you carve out the time so that you can stay in constant communications with them. Uh, but really, that's kind of what the results piece is, is all about, is accomplishing the goals, understanding for those that we didn't accomplish, why, those lessons learned, and then let's make adjustments, and then let's go attack them again. Awesome. Man, that was, uh, that was great. Any, we got a couple minutes here. If anybody has a, a burning question out of that that uh, they want to ask Mark, otherwise we'll, uh, we'll take it in the Slack. Anybody got a question? 
Hey, Mark, no, no question, but commentary, if we, you know, do a follow-up session and unpack like the different layers of this as well, love the operating model. One of the things that I think is really interesting about this is honing in on goals and metrics, specifically when we're in these ecosystems that are multifaceted and, you know, our external stakeholders and internal stakeholders have different perspectives of what the, the vision, mission, goals, metrics should be. And what I mean by that is to what you alluded on the last call is more of a channel transactional model versus strategic alliances working with like an Accenture or Deloitte or others and how you would leverage this uh, op model to sort of blend the, the DNA type of, of a partner against those um, specific steps as well. Yeah, I love that, Seth. And here's what I will say to that. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that I see um, no matter how much we want certain companies to love us mm-hmm. because we think they'll be such a great fit for us, we can't make every company love us. And so if there's, one, if there's one thing that I would like for companies to do more, that's spend more time on the front end to, to a, try to find organizations that are well aligned with us, that will love us. And they'll provide that value for us because we're very few of of us organizations are big enough, strong enough, powerful enough to get an Accenture, to get a Microsoft Mm -hmm. to do what we want them to do. Mm -hmm. Companies that big, we're just along for the ride. We just hope to God we get value and love while we're at it. Yeah, absolutely. Good commentary. All right. Uh, we're at time here, guys. Um, hopefully, most of you will join us on the second session yes. um, next week. Same time, same day next week. And that will be on strategy to execution. Um, and if you have any questions, let's take the conversation in the Slack and we'll try to get them answered. Uh, but for now, thanks for joining and uh, I will uh, see you guys soon. For more great insights on partnerships and software, like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video.